is a talk show with published authors, writers, and content creators discussing both the creative and technical sides of writing, as well as the industry surrounding it from novels to screenplays to comics and more. And now, here's your host, author Travis I. Sivart. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Write Night. It is Saturday, May 16th, and tonight's topics will be visualization to actualization for the first hour, the creative hour, and the second hour will be entangled research, where we discuss where we get entangled and go down that rabbit hole of research. So, I am Travis Sivart. I am your host and also author of many books, including Croker Norge Case Files, which is essentially... uh, Sherlock Holmes meets the odd couple. There we go. Hello to everybody who has joined us. I'm going to introduce our authors, and then I will say hello to everybody in the crowd. Don't forget, if you guys ever hear this noise right here, it means Travis wants to read a viewer's comment. Let's start with the person directly above me, Aaron. Hi. <laughs> uh, I'm Aaron Kennedy. Uh, I'm... A technical writer uh, for 25 years. I've been published in the Army Times and the uh, the NCO Journal, as well as my book uh, Persona Non Grata, the first in the Ships of Valor series. Currently working on uh, the Icarus Black Chronicles. Very exciting. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Michael's our hero. Michael, why don't we pass it over to you real quick? Hey, everyone. My name is Michael Thompson. I am an independent author and illustrator. My latest book is. Chicken Boy and the Might of the Monkey Man, action-packed, humorous adventure for uh, middle grade readers and up. Uh, very fun, very cool. Check it out, Amazon. <laughs> a great personal story arc for Chicken Boy. Yes. I almost said Chicken Man. <laughs> I would have been horrified. Let's drop down there to Tempe. Oh, nice. Hold that up again. Ah, oh, that's very cool. Oh, my this goodness. Is classic. Oh, this is classic. <laughs> and Tempe? It tastes better. Everything tastes better out of a chicken boy mug. <laughs> That's your, there's your slogan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm Tempe Wade. I'm the author of the Timely Revolution book series, uh, which is an, it's a historical time travel fantasy fiction that takes you back to the Revolutionary War, 18th century, to George Washington, the call for spy rings, and all of that good stuff. And book five will be out next week. Yay! There we go. Do you have an actual Woo! day or just sometime next week? Just as soon as the cover artist finishes the, the work, it'll be ready to go. Very so. good. Now, first time on Right Night, though you've seen him on Talk of the Tavern as well as Stealing Survival, allow me to introduce John Millington, who knows how to intro himself. Go ahead. Well, I'm John Millington from Conquest Publishing. Here's a sample. Look at that. To see. Um, We are not only a publishing company, but we're a studio. Uh, Our objective is to help train people uh, to get their start in the comic book industry and the book industry. Uh, You can look at some of the works that we've done at conquestuniverse.com, and there'll be three more websites coming up soon. And I'm also associated with Jersey's Cards and Comics. That's the home store that we work at up here in Kings, Virginia. And once again, I just have to point out, this is the level of talent we hang out with here on Right Night. Um, It's a diverse crowd that does all kinds of things, and very few of us only do one thing. So many of us have so many irons in the fire. Um, So it's just an incredible group that I am, am blessed to hang out with by wrangling them, whipping them, beating them, begging them to show up on Mm -hmm. Saturday night to hang out with me. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you hanging out in the viewer land here in the tavern, I do want to say hello to Spacey Tracy and Dropsom and Cavalon, who's Chris. Thank you for joining us, guys. Appreciate that. And I want to remind anybody viewing, you can catch us afterwards, whether it's on twitch.tv slash Travis Talk for the highlight afterwards for the full show, on YouTube, on podcasts, on uh, iHeartRadio, on uh, Stitcher, on Spreaker, on Dasher, on Dancer, on Prancer, on Vixen. Um, <laughs> we're, we're everywhere. And for those of you 
who are catching us on the podcast, don't forget, us. you can join us live and interact with us via our instantaneous chat feature that is unique only to us and every other one of the million people who go to twitch.tv slash Travis Davern talk. Um, I think that's good for intros and, and, and pimping the goods. Everybody, anybody got anything yeah. before we jump right into the creative topic of visualization to actualization? Very good. Let's, Let's do move this. forward. Aaron, I'd like to just toss this right in your lap because this was actually Aaron's idea as we were brainstorming for seven minutes after a show. This is one Aaron mentioned. So why don't you talk about your concept? Okay, well, uh, basically, yeah, at least for me, I'll get a flash of insight. I'm uh, sorry. Just I'm, something. If I can just interrupt. Drop some, just drop some 1,500 bits into the it's chat. Thank you, Drop. Ooh, appreciate that, man. man. Thank you so much. He also resubscribed right before we went on air. And Aaron, apologies. I, I should have remembered no, no. to do this. Not at all. 22 months. He has subscribed for 22 months. It's almost two years of supporting us here on Twitch. I th think he's one of my f first ones, I think. Um, anyhow, okay, Aaron, please continue on or restart if you feel the need to. It's, I interrupted eight words in. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so the initial concept that I had was I get flashes of insight, and it sometimes it's just stupid little things. Like uh, Persona Non Grata, began with a flash of insight of Aerie sitting in a spaceport waiting to go home. That was actually cut from the, the final portion of the book. Um, but what would happen is, I'm like, okay, we got this, and then from there, how do we get a story, something coherent, instead of just this little inspiration seed, a uh, term I've used before. Um, right now, I'm actually working on the Icarus Black one, and I'm like, okay... Where did I fail with Persona Non Grata, which led me down this rabbit hole, uh, which we'll get to in the second half. Mm -hmm. uh, of it, what can I, what could I do better to make this more of a book that I wanted to write um, the first time? And little things like, okay, uh, Ari is an aged hero. He's kind of at the end of his career instead of the beginning. Uh, so I said, okay, we'll start one at the beginning. Well. Who does it right? Where does it hit? How does it kind of work and things like that? And start going, okay, well, think Harry Potter. Think Artemis Fowl. And you get that 13-year-old time frame. So now I've got Icarus Black. He's 13 years old. I want it to be space. And I want it to be in my existing universe just because it makes it easy. Not necessarily the same timeline, but in that realm. And that kind of got me, okay, I've got my young hero. Um, and then I'm like, well... We've talked about it previously. You've got there's only so many plots, the nine basics, the twenty seven expanded, and things like that. What you got, Travis? You know, business wise, I think a young adult sci fi series is almost untouched out there that I've seen. We've seen all kinds of wizard stuff. We've seen all kinds of uh -huh. magic. We've seen time travel and and urban fantasy. I don't. I uh -huh. can't think of off the top of my head sci-fi young adult so well done dinging a nice cross mix there that hasn't really been mined yet no no and uh, i i went through this kind of the same thought process uh earlier and it's always got that realm of fantasy mm -hmm. but not necessarily the realm of sci-fi well this um, is why fantasy falls we, under we pair them together but that's why hmm? fantasy falls under sci-fi. It's it's science fiction and fantasy is under it because they're very much tons of similarity. Oh, absolutely. I mean, friggin' Star Wars, it's Space Wizard. It's, it's a fantasy thing that happens to take place in space. It's King right. Arthur. Um, and uh, it's a Western. <laughs> but, but it's all those things. Right. Uh, so but, yeah, that was sorry. kind of... Uh, oh, no. Um, so that's kind of where this, my seed idea took place. And then I'm like, okay, I'm sitting here doing actualization notes, uh, my handy dandy rocket book, um, where I'm going, okay, well, what do I need in order to kind of hit this out? And that kind of went into a lot of technical type things, but the Lester Dent, uh, stuff. I'll go ahead, Travis. Real quick, Michael, John, Tempe, 
are you guys familiar with Rocket Books or anybody else who's viewing? You, I am not. It sounds Aaron, cool. Give them a 45 second description sales pitch of these things. Okay. A Rocket Book is a waterproof notepad. It comes with this pen uh, and a little friggin' towel like thing that you wipe it off with when you're done. No, excuse me, about to sneeze. You got the Zika. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Good thing. Oh, there'll you be another one in 20 <laughs> seconds. Um, but what's kind of cool about these is you write stuff in it. Uh, you can erase it off, but it's got our little QR reader in the corner, uh, and you just take a picture of it, and it saves it on your phone for later use. Oh, nice. Uh, more than uh, that. Yeah. Oh. It also has icons down the side that you can assign to different places. So it automatically oh, yes. sends it to Dropbox, Google Drive, etc. It will mm -hmm. auto load them to it. And I recently got four corners that are Rocket Book corners, so I could put them on my dry erase board. Yeah, it's hard to see, but he's got them nope. there. They, oh, yeah, it's hard to see. It's they were light. coming in, Aaron. They were they were focusing in. If you want to hold it back up, while I'm proudly. I got four okay. corners that I could put on a dry erase board or a painting on the wall huh. or whatever. And when I snap the picture, it recognizes those are the Rocket Book brackets, and I can load it just like his page. Huh. So, oh, nice. well, that's yeah. just fascinating. Yeah, uh, it, it's nice. Tool. Okay, go on, Aaron. Um, so I, I'm a big paper notes kind of guy. Yeah. Um. As a matter of fact, when I did that for my camera, I identified the QR reader and started pulling it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm a big paper notes kind of guy, and I was working through this trying to figure out, okay, what can I do here? How do I want to do this? I'm like, all right, well, I'm a big fan of the three-act play, and so I'm like, okay, hit your beats. Um, and I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it as a series, uh, but plan it from birth, uh, from cradle to grave. Um, and it lines back up with your... Um. Uh, the Harry Potter series, the Artemis Fowls, um, Wizard War, uh, all these various types of things, and it's like, oh, let's do this, um, and then do it in three distinct arcs, which become three acts of the greatest uh, of the greater thing. Yeah. Um. So that's kind of the inspiration that I got there, and then I'm like, okay, well, once I've got this, what's my beat for per book? One goal one concept per book but i want it to be distinct adventures um so the first one is the escape from gabardine station um the second one i'll probably do something i'm gonna flip it do something extreme contrast to that and then on third i'll do that and that'll create the the first arc which i'm calling the federation arc smart uh second arc will lead into the next political group that's part of the ships of valor universe which is going to be um the Imperial Arc, and so on and so forth. And before you go too much further on that, I want to jump around the screen here to some of the other folks and let them tell a little bit about how their process, how they come up with from idea to completion. And Tempe, I know you have... Oh. Aaron, I'm sorry? You, you said, Oh, no, uh, no, absolutely. Okay, I didn't want to, like, if you're like, wait, just let me finish. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no. Um, so yeah, Tempe, you're good. You're what good. about your process of going, oh, I have an idea. And you could even start back to the lunch we had in the Chinese restaurant where you had an idea. And what steps did you take? And now book five is coming out 12 to 18 months after book one. Yeah, you know, mine's a little different mm -hmm. from the rest of you guys because mine came from a place of, every woman kind of has this fantasy world in her head mm -hmm. <laughs> that she goes to uh, when, you know, she's bored or daydreams or whatever. And that's where my storyline kind of came from. So that's, you know, I just kind of wrote what kind of popped into my head. And when it came to the historical stuff, it just so happened the historical part just fit right in. Um, every time I would go research a fact, for the timeline for what I was working on. Oh, there just happened to be one that worked fit perfectly and worked just right for what I needed. So that's, that's the way I, I kind of came up with my stuff. And, and I tell people this when we do panels, I'm like, every woman has that world in her head and you'll see the women in the audience going, yeah, <laughs> <I'd> <laughs> we all see. do. 
I think every person does. Guy, girl, gender neutral. I think everybody has this healthy fantasy activity in their brains. Um, and also, so you just mentioned you researched certain points. Did you, like, make a list of these points and how they tied into your story? Um, no, I just, you know, if I needed something, like, revolutionary mm -hmm. war-wise to fit where I needed to fit, I would just go, like, start going through notes and, and pulling up information and, oh, look, this person was here at that time. This person was at this battle, right where my character was, happened to be at the time, and I just kind of fitted it in that way. Um, and it, it just it just worked. It just clicked every time. I didn't have a point where I didn't have something click in where I needed it to. So it was like a, you know, like Legos, click, click, click. There okay. you go, and I built from there. So Okay. I'll jump over to Michael. And, Michael, keep in mind you've got a couple different things that you've done that might have different processes. And I'm going to save John for last as our guest so he can kind of... And also John having a very different point of view, though he does write predominantly artistically and comic book, which, as we learned from Elizabeth with movies, it's the same, but it has different ways of doing things. Or you very much have a marketing timeline that pounds along with it because of the way things are done in the industry. Um, but, Michael, if I could jump to you, and then you just pass it to John when you're done. And, again, guys, don't forget, you can interrupt each other to make it a conversation. Or you could totally let people monologue like evil villains. Michael, speaking of evil villains. Mwahaha. <laughs> <laughs> Mwahaha. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, there's a couple ways that uh, the, the vision uh, comes to fruition when it comes to uh, the production of these things. Um, and I, 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 when, when Aaron was talking about those uh, inspiration seeds or those flashes, that really resonated with me because they're, they're for, a lot of, for a lot of my projects, uh, it starts with one scene out of context, and I'm and I think to myself, what what is going on here? The first scene that I ever saw, and I think I mentioned this in a, in an earlier episode, but the first th scene I ever saw for World of the Orb was uh, the the Krakor chase, which was this massive sea serpent chasing this small small boat um, that's being just thrown around in this cyclonic turbulent uh, uh, current. Uh, that, with this rip sail right and all these little characters. Great description. For me, just those like two, three sentences, I have a total image in my head. And the funny thing is, it's flashing from almost comic book to oil painting to movie, it, as you describe certain mm. points. Yeah, it, and it's interesting. For, for, each of the, for each of my different projects, because there's an element of, of artwork that I do for each of the projects, and... Uh, you kind of become the artist, bo both writer and, and illustrator, that you need to be for for a kind for a work. So e each of the books, like they they want to be written in a certain way, it feels, and uh, or want to be uh, uh, illustrated in a certain way. And I have I have thick books of um, of these character drawings for World of the Orb, and I know that you do this, Travis, where you have you have the mental image of a character, and then you or or a place or a map. And then you'd apply it to a, into a page, and the interesting thing that happens when you do that is you kind of you, you zoom in, you know, and you get you get that fine detail that you do, and um, it's this sort of exploration. It's like moving uh, like the spotlight of your focus across like very specific parts of yeah. your character. So then, when that reapplies into the writing part of what you do, then you can give this this very detailed description you zoom um, in. based on the pacing of your book. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and, for and sure. And you do that with not only visual things, but <clears throat> story points too, where you have this picture yeah. of your story, and then you zoom in to write a scene. Yeah, for me. Yeah, definitely. I kind of think of it as a tarp and pinhole. Um, a what? Especially like with the tarp and pinhole method is what I call it. Um, it's like when you are doing world building for like a big, especially epic fantasy. Uh, you have these Bibles or encyclopedias of your world and how everything works, and uh, but when you're when you're uh, applying that to the page, it's kind of like you're throwing a tarp over that and then you're uh, putting a pinhole in that tarp, and so wherever wherever that pinhole happens to line up for the reader, you have a, a very specific 
uh, scene or image or character uh, displayed for your reader. Um, but you don't you don't go crazy with uh, you know expository stuff. It, it keeps it real focused. Um, and and then on top of that, it compounds because your reader just feels like it, it goes on living beyond what they can see. Makes so sense. I call the tarpon pinhole method. That's a good analogy. That's that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Thank um, you. Yeah, I like yeah. that. <laughs> what about you, John? Well, hold on. Well, we talk a little uh, before we pass uh, it to John. Do you want to talk a little bit about Winslow or Chicken Boy? Because Chicken Boy will definitely lead into other things John can very much tie into. Or do you want to just pass it to John, which is fine. Oh, yeah. We got the, we got the superhero connection. <laughs> um, Sorry, John. I think uh, for, for Winslow, Winslow is very... Um, Winslow is a lot like listening. Mm -hmm. So, so I'll, I'll go through my, my three major things. So, so Winslow, the first line is what came to me. Uh, so I don't know if it was visualization as much as it was like being shaken awake by this this one out of place line, uh, which I said, which I've said before, which is, uh, have you ever stared straight into the eyes of death and scoffed? And that line came to me back in high school and I didn't know uh, what it was, but I could hear the, the salty, gravelly voice that was delivering it and, and just feel this pulse of mystery and, and intrigue. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. And I put that in a document and saved it for later until I knew what it was. And in the second hour, the, the, my research and my interest <laughs> in cryptozoology really what like spiraled this into clarity for me. Um, but with Chicken Boy, Chicken Boy was, uh, oh yeah, Chicken, Chicken Boy came from uh, my love of superheroes and my love of animals. So I wanted to make an animal superhero. I love Looney Tunes and Marvel and stuff. And so all my, all my interests just kind of collided there. And, um, and I and I've told I've told this story uh, earlier in the show, but uh, I was I, I had my first teacher that encouraged me to draw during class, and so I had this creative awakening. And every every day I went home, I was creating new characters. And Chicken Boy came when I was watching this animal rescue show, and I saw this uh, this baby vulture. <laughs> and uh, if you notice, Chicken Boy doesn't look like a chicken at all. Uh, <laughs> and he's based on that baby vulture, um, but I thought Chicken Boy sounded better. And uh, his whole origin is an homage to Spider-Man. He eats radioactive bird seed and then becomes super strong and stuff. Um, and yeah, and then when you're when you're cartooning or illustrating, uh, that just developing those patterns and how you draw, um, and and turning your character around in all sorts of different uh, spaces that really uh, that that, that really that really fleshes them out in a way because you see them in all sorts of different situations and. Uh, especially in cartoons, you can really like <laughs> get all sorts of crazy expressions. Um, so part of the story is told in the expressions and the action, especially in Chicken Boy and, and books like that. Um, so, yeah, those are my those are my three major uh, areas that I'm working on. John, take it away, my friend. Yeah. Well, for me, uh, things are a bit unique. It, it really boils down to what pair of shoes that I'm wearing and what function I'm doing at the time. So um, I might be working with a New York Times bestseller short story and we're just doing conversions into script formats. And the visualizations are usually pretty much uh, developed in that. If I'm working with young people, uh, we're more developing an idea into a visualization and then into a story because yeah. we're giving them prompts. Well, this is a good idea. How do we move from this to this? And then, well, you know, write it down and we visualize these particular things. Uh, the other thing is to tell them, um, don't get bogged down by somebody telling you that, well, that's just like Spider-Man or that's just like this or that. Um, no, that's what yours is. And that doesn't matter what somebody else thinks. If you worry about those things and you're not getting your story done. That's, so, that's very true. Um, and then we've got, kind of um, professionals that are past um, students. And usually the, the issue that I run into most with those are that, well, I've got this all in my head. Well, I can't be an editor in your head because I yeah. can't read that. I need to <laughs> on a piece of paper in front of me so we can discuss this. And, and the industry goes about it in different ways too. So sometimes we work in teams and committees Mm -hmm. So we'll have the writer and the anchor and the letter and the colorist and everybody there. And the editor will say, well, this is the vision that we want to go as a company from 
this moving forward. We want to, you know, promote this particular character. Um, other projects like, um, uh, let's take, for example, we have Captain Allen, which is a cartoon um, about basically the lighthouse down in Nags Head that turns into a giant robot and stuff. Well, that's cool. I need more than, hey, this is your idea, but let's visualize all the things that we need to do to build this into a congruent story. Uh, so it, it is good to, to foster that initial idea and then try to get them to visualize where it's going to. So a lot of times we're doing uh, character breakdowns. We're doing um, scenery breakdowns. Oh, nice. Genre back into the thing is, is the key thing for the story, too. Um, I can't have a colorist uh, like for our white bird title. It happens during World War II with a, with a fairy pilot. I can't have bright superhero colors and stuff in this book. I need olive drabs. I need it needs to match the visualization needs to match the period. Color palette. So in comics, in comics yeah. spread across a huge uh, visualization of things. Uh, just as much as movies are, comics will do the same thing. So. so what am, um, if I may, John, I'm, I'm hearing you're in a mentor role at this point in your career, in your life, in your artistic expression. Because I know you've drawn, you, you've done comic level art before. You've definitely written short stories and other things. So what I'm hearing, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like your job for yourself that you've put yourself into is helping other people finding their way to visualize and then bring it to actualization, help them find their path and their method. Right, and, that, and that's what we are. We foster people. We give them the ability to get into the industry. What's now the, the people that are already in the industry get them restarted into the industry. Now, I will be honest. I have my toe into our emissary wars title. Uh -huh. um, I have in you know I'm doing the writing mostly for our uh, uh, one of our other titles too. Um, and sometimes it does boil down to like one of our illustrators, he's got a, gr the, a good idea for Pulse, but he doesn't have time to sit down and write it. So I'm writing the scripts for him and he's doing the pencils and stuff. So uh, sometimes it's a lot of coordination. It's like, well, all right, this project's doing this. And then we have a role playing game that we're working on. So, you know, overall, yes, being the CEO, I've got to, you know, look at all the different projects and say, all right. I can dedicate time to this particular thing, or I need to delegate this here. Uh, hopefully down the road, I mean, that's where I can then go to one of these people and say, I need you to help mentor this person in, in this particular thing. So I mean, that's the that. overall goal. I love that about John, so. guys. He is uh, he's building a network. He is networking in the old-fashioned way of supporting others as opposed to just pulling them in to help him. Um, Aaron and I were at his shop today, and there's been many times that John has supplied an extra piece of electronics, whether it's a microphone or a camera or a monitor or a software, a piece of software, or just introducing one person to another person. I mentioned to you guys the convention he's hoping for. Is it September now, John? Am, am I correct in that or August? Well, um, so our Comic-Con is August, the first week of August, um, bearing, you know, obviously mm. how things are. Um, Griffin Con, unfortunately, has been, for William and Mary, has been uh, pushed off to next year. We were going to try to do it in October, but it's not in the cards with the college right now. So, um, But now we have um, some local authors and groups that are wanting to now start coalescing together and start kind of working together. So um, another publishing group uh, just got a hold of me. They, they're willing to, to work on a couple of things. Um, and, and I'll talk with Tara a little bit too with, with Dream Punk Press and see, you know, where where alliances can be formed and, you know, so everybody scratches each other's back. Let's talk and we about, all get, you know, better. Let's talk about that. How do you encourage people to work together to help bring their ideas with other people to create a bigger project, a bigger idea? What's what's your steps through that? I know that's a tough question. Well, I mean, and Aaron. My, my main advantage is that I'm six feet tall and I'm bigger than everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Sheer oh, intimidation. <laughs> Aaron, you raised your hand. Did you want to say something before we get too far into it? I, yeah, but I got one for this. Um, little things like what we're doing here. Um, 
on I think it was episode two or episode three, Michael pointed out that oh we got the we all came in here kind of as the writers and the creators of this, but uh, Michael's got the visual arts background uh, that helps tremendously. You can be sure that I'm going to freaking contact him when I got Icarus Black um, kind of in my first draft stage. I'm, I'm going to want a cover or I'm going to want freaking uh, icons uh, hidden throughout it. Um, my initial thoughts were uh, there's these great persona fo- uh, pictures that you see in um, in the comic world uh, and Cartoon Network where it just shows the quick outlines of Thank a you, character, Victoria, for the bit. But shown a different... Uh, Carry on, Aaron. Woo-hoo. Uh, shown in different poses and kind of views. Yeah. Uh, which I think one would suit his style greatly and I think would kind of work well with the feel that I'm trying to do um, to set up, especially if I'm looking at it over a series length because I can fr- that's infinitely expandable. Yeah. Um, and it gives you a, a case of, hey, what's going on here? Uh, but... Freaking, we had Tara on Tara as an editor. I'm going to freaking contact her first and go, okay, hey, one, do you have time? Um, and two, can I get a quote? Because freaking, I don't expect anybody to work for free. Um, I already know that I can't afford Michael, but uh, I know how to beg. <laughs> <laughs> or he may just go, ooh, I like this project. And yeah, the classic, uh, uh, the passion piece project. Uh, you get guys like uh, John Malkovich. John Malkovich has publicly said, Oh yeah, Con Air. Sometimes you just gotta pay the bills so he can do the other movies that he likes to do. Mm. Hey, Michael, I hear Aaron can detail a car like nobody's business. So there you oh, go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, he'll put me in charge of his momager and then go for there. <laughs> a little little uh, bartering. <laughs> I tell you what, Michael. Something else. He's also a very uh, adept electrician and HVAC technician, and he has helped oh, me with go. both things. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, and and okay. that's something <laughs> I just fake the funk really good. <laughs> if I'm not stepping on anybody's toes, um, it's one thing. The reason this show came up is I wanted that support network as I'm going through my own process to be able to talk about what I'm doing and what I'm working on and how to improve mine because each one of you have different views. And whether I take from you or not, I want to hear it because it's one more way, one more tool in the toolbox. And this allows me to support you guys in the same way and our viewers and listeners in the same way, giving them the benefit of taking from our experience or discarding part of our experience. So hopefully they don't have to go through some of those tribulations. Yeah, John. Yeah, just remember it's a nut that doesn't necessarily fit this situation, but it might later on. Right. It might be something that you need to fix something later. So it's very true. You know. It's never well, wasted. Well, I mean, that goes back to some of the writing that we'll do. We'll do. Uh, I, had, me and Travis had this conversation earlier, but I probably edit out 15, 10 to 15% and then add back in five. He's mm-hmm. probably a little bit flipped on that for me. Uh, but I've got scenes that don't fit in other stuff, but I never, I never destroy it. It's all, it's just moved on to a previous revision. Uh, yeah. And there's parts of, uh, ships of valor that i'm going to definitely use uh in icarus uh there's stuff there's arguments that i've made in my editorial writing that will seep their way back in um let alone friggin the phd studies and everything else mm-hmm. and that's, i'm sure bring john's the, never discarded anything creation of you know because that's what all that material is yeah it's like here's artwork we didn't use but this is the creation of this particular character yeah. Right. to the evolutions of these things. See, and down so, the road, with is... a certain level of notoriety or fame or whatever, these broken tidbits that we discarded can be used for other things. Tolkien did it. Many writers have done it. It can go into the art of the world of your book. You know, we've seen this with Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time and George R. R. Martin's and countless others. Uh, Pern. Uh, yeah. Uh, even that, uh, Michael Bay has reused car chase scenes. Um, <laughs> has he? To where, well, no, no, uh, and, and I, I point this out, okay? The reason Michael Bay got the Transformer movie is because he is the best car chase person in Hollywood. There is zero doubt about that. Um, but he's got a couple chase scenes where a car flips and does things like that, 
and you can find that same scene CGI'd to where oh the car flips and then it becomes a transformer. How uh, oh it's it's a beautiful scene. Um, the shoot friggin uh, the, uh, Wolverine is an example friggin. He's got classic poses that has been done by every artist that's ever touched him. Right. Um, it, you can reuse pieces and it looks good. Or it becomes a uh, pay an homage or visual or... catchphrase. Mm-hmm. John, you raised your hand. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think the key thing, too, is with... Um, I never think of them as discarded uh, things anyway. Because what I might consider or consider that something that's broken, somebody might love. Right. You know, if you listen to... I mean, like Tara went over, like they wanted to you know, get rid of Neville or some character out of Harry Potter. Well, if other people like it, then you you go back and you you re envision that particular character, um, and, and that's the whole thing about that is that, um, and I think most writers they'll write what they like and want. Um, the comic book industry is a little less forgiving in that um, they have an audience and they they want what they want. Right. You got to sell books. Want. Which so sometimes that, is, that locks us into something where they don't allow the change to create something new. I will point at mm. Star Trek The Next Generation, DS9 followed that formula, Voyager followed that formula, DS9 kind of broke away from it, which made it a better show. But now if we look at Picard and Discovery and even, uh, uh, what's that other one, Expanse, these are new ways of telling stories and it's not drastically different, it's just a little different, and we're finding it wonderful. And it took 20 years for the industry to change, which doesn't mean we didn't want it 20 years ago when we are watching Voyager going, this again? You know, so it, it's... I think John might agree with me on this one. If you want to create change in the industry, do it small steps at a time. And allow the industry to get mm. what they need so you can get into the industry. And then but, once you have your name, go ahead, John. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. Because, and then, as you said, once you have your name, then they're following you. Right. And, and you're yeah. setting the lead and stuff for it. So. And this is why we watch some of those John Malkovich passion pieces where this is what he really wants to do because we're following John Malkovich now, not the industry. Mm. This is why, what was the John, inside John Malkovich, what was it? Uh, being John Malkovich. That's right. That was uh, a very interesting. Movie. Yeah, it, which is a it is a surreal movie, and everybody should watch it at least once. Well, the the, the key thing to remember is that you remember the things that are unique and creative mm -hmm. and new, and you don't remember the things that were normal and the same, you That's know, true. all the way through. So, but it might um, be the familiar comfort food of entertainment that draws you in initially. But then when you give them something different and new, Happy is a great comparison for the series from the graphic novel where here's something, it's been done, but not heavily and not quite in that way, and it's delightful in a very... Well, there's aspect. a reason we follow genres, too. It's true. Uh, I, I mean, friggin', oh, I'm look, I, go, I go over to the sci-fi section, I go and I look for something new, something different, but I'm still looking for sci-fi. Right. Um, and vice versa, uh, and fantasies the same way. Uh, I'm sure Tempe runs into the same issue where they're looking for the romance, not necessarily that, but a fantasy or a romance, and it that's her draw audience. Right. But th right. that's the greatest pleasure for me in in this particular industry is that I get to hear everybody's different genres and stuff. I'm not locked into that. Eh, John, I just like science fiction. You know. Nope. I mean, we've got anime, we've got manga, I mean, type star stories, cartoons. It's just a whole wide gamut of it. And the thing is that kids are so creative, you just have to help, you know, step them along and keep them rolling with their ideas and stuff. Yeah, yeah. A great and in many cases... Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, well, in many cases, you you have uh, these, like, crossover genres, and you have... It's like, here here's the genre you're familiar with that you can hang your hat on, and then here's how... Uh, you've never seen it before like like you mentioned happy it's like it, to me that's it's very much like a noir mm -hmm. but it's like oh uh, imaginary friends are real and they're and they're hovering all over the place and you right. have this 
you know, contrast of light and dark. So it it's blended Toy right. it's, Story it's, into uh, this dark noir. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good way a, to put. It. Another thing I'll say here to to totally give us a related tangent: role playing games mm -hmm. are a great great mm -hmm. way to explore character development, scene development, and genre twists. Um, with and whether you play only one type or whether you play 50 different games over whatever period of time, it, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, I just picked up a new game from John today, as well as some Star Wars stuff that I love. Um, yeah, Aaron? Oh, well, I mean, take a look at uh, last week's episode of Stealing for Survival. Um, where I'm running it, it's Star Wars. But I, I tend to run a goofy game. Um, I, mine is more comedic in presence because people are funny. Therefore, their characters are funny. Right. Um, well, and what they'll come up with, and you've got this dark, gritty universe that is Star Wars. It is a worn down universe, at least <laughs> after the original trilogy. Everything's yeah. worn down. Everything's gritty and dirty. But you add that contrast of, okay, what are... What kind of funny things can happen to these characters? Whether it's you seen all that stuff was a joke. <laughs> no, am I a clown to you, sir? Bobo <laughs> <laughs> ah. the clown. I <laughs> heard about Bobo the clown. Have you heard about? <laughs> if you were there, <laughs> hard to say. <laughs> no, so, I mean, Blood no. Murder, which is a role-playing game that Conquest uh, Comics is working on right now. Mm -hmm. It is a. Uh, no genre-related, uh, no class-related, easy-to-play role-playing system. That What's you play. the name of it? Uh, it's Merger. We're working on it right now. We're at 30%, but you're more than welcome to come in. Plug it in with us, Amanda and Rebecca and me, and you know, sit down on a Thursday on chat and John, go over some more ideas. John, can you give a two-minute breakdown and rundown of the game? Because I love right, this so project. So, <laughs> Merger basically is based off of, at one time, the Druids on Earth. So it's all Earth-centric. So it's easy for you to identify with the universe. Sort of like that's why Star Wars, everybody likes to play it because they know what's going on. But it's Earth, and the Druids attempted to um, have this grand spell, and it ended up splitting Earth into three dimensions. Ah. So Earth magic continued along its path. Earth science continued along its path. And then the noir and the psychic continued along its path. So mind, body, soul, basically. Okay. Um, we go into the future, or science, which is our Earth, uh, fashion and light communication array to our satellite on, on Jupiter. Uh, basically went awry and forced all of those uh, split apart dimensions to come back together again. So we have merger, and all those genres now exist. Magic exists on Earth, science, and and we go over how there's pockets of magic and different things and stuff on Earth now. And uh, and that's the basic premise of it. All those things now exist. And they have their own foothold in, in Earth. Now, we're, we're not going to have, right off the bat, like huge dragons and stuff flying around and things. It's, um, but those will come. Those will come out of portals in different areas in the story arcs. So we also want to have a good story that goes along with the, the genre of the book. D&D uh, mm. &D has Greyhawk and a couple other things that you can kind of, you know, um, we, we want to have a story where, you know, you're kind of identified with what's going on also. So. Neat. So it's all being worked on. You can make a character in less than a minute if you want to, or you can spend a week making a character. Nice. We'll do all the math for you, and you can, as simple as picking three templates and putting your name on your character and playing. So if you want to be a gun-toting wizard, you know, priest... You know, you, you can easily make one. And if I'm not mistaken, nice, nice. the merger Netflix. thing also comes from corporations running certain aspects of the world that ties into three different worlds. Is that correct? Correct. So yes. you kind of have shadow governments oh, battling shadow governments. A little, a little bit of shadow run and stuff that's, you know, in, in the background, too. So he's there, got there's an immortal that's... Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, there's an immortal that's actually trying to end his existence as the overarching story. Um, and he thinks that if he can get Earth, uh, people of Earth through his his cults to try to split Earth uh, back again, uh, that all their loved ones will come back that were lost in the merger to start with. He just wants to end his existence. He knows that that will end up killing him. He doesn't care if everybody else dies. He just 
wants it to happen. That is suicide so. with style right there, isn't it? <laughs> it is. We'll get rid of a whole planet. Now, here's a massive undertaking working with at least a handful of people, if not dozens of people, because John's approached me about at some point in time I might come to you for this or this or even something as simple as how to stream on Twitch to as complex as going, do you want to write for this whole shadow group? Um, so, yeah, it's amazing. Oh. I don't want to necessarily take up too much of the show about it, but That's I definitely really wanted to cool touch on that. Project. Aaron, did you raise your hand? I did, I did, because uh, this kind of ties back to his stuff, but uh, you've done friggin' anthologies and uh, collaborative works as well um, in that regards. And, um, shoot, I've done other stuff off to the side where, okay, hey, there's dozens of articles that are all being kind of merged together in a pamphlet and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but getting the right people kind of tied up and the right projects linked up is a big deal. It is. And I've put on, like, uh, conventions and stuff like that. So this is kind of similar, actually, you know, the, the comic book company into running a show, basically. So, I mean, sometimes it's, you know, who can do this and who can be there and, and you know, who can what talent can I get to work on said thing. So, so I'd love to ask uh, a question of each person. <clears throat> and keep in mind, we got about 15 minutes left in the first hour. I'd love to know what was your easiest, I've got an idea, to putting it down to the hardest, I've got an idea. I put it down. Tempe, do you need a minute to think this over, or can we jump right on you there? No, uh, the the timely series was the easiest for me. Um, obviously, if I wrote five books in five months, it just kind of flowed right along. So uh, that was the easiest. The, the hardest has been the fantasy piece that I'm working on now because I'm not used to dealing with the the different worlds, the fantasy worlds. I know that you guys play all the games, the role-playing games and stuff, and I don't. Um, so I actually found myself at 4 or 5 a.m. one morning sitting down drawing out a map for myself oh. with the world I was working on just so I could have a visual to say, okay, this this is this world, this is where this person is, this is what stuff looks like here. Um, and th that that's that's been the hardest thing, but I think that piece that I'm working on now may be one of the most rewarding by the time I'm done with it. So, it's, you know, as beautiful as it is when something just flows and falls out of you, it, and how amazed you are when you're like, "Oh my God, I just did that." When you really have to put put new muscles into the work, it is, I think, right. well, more it, rewarding. What, Aaron? If it wasn't challenging, it wouldn't be fun. Uh, think of the easy video games that you've all that we've all beaten at one point or another. We don't remember those. We remember having to freaking beat Bowser on level ten, uh, trying to do his or what is it eight four? That's the one we care about. So um, or the final battle in Zelda. And what about um, you, Aaron, with your easiest and hardest thing while you're talking? Once you finish your thought here. Um, certain chapters in Persona Non Grata were significantly easier than others um i wrote myself into a corner in politicus which is the second book in that series and i've been trying to get myself out of it um but because i've got a limited number of characters it's hard to just pull somebody back in right. i know where it's at i know where it's got to get i just can't bridge the gap can we offer moments. a brainstorming so, session at some point in time to help you uh, possibly, possibly. Okay. Aaron, how uh, about I just give you a few of my characters because I have too many at this point. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, no. I, I, I try to keep. You got to get away before they get killed. <laughs> right. Uh, I got it. Uh, well, there's a reason I'm freaking doing a palate cleanse with the Icarus Black stuff as right. well. Um, I know where I failed and what I've done, what I did wrong in certain aspects there. Now I'm doing very distinct outlining things like this. Um, opening couple chapters or nice and locked in but i know exactly where this story ends and i know the beats to get there so um i don't think i can write myself into the same corner that i did with politicus it's i have definitely written myself into corners and the way i got myself out of quite a few of them is i imagined if i was running a role-playing game 
what stupid shit would my players come up with to get out of this situation? Because they do. And as a game master or a writer, mm -hmm. you want them to get out of this tough spot, but you don't want it to be oh, yeah. totally ridiculous or, you know, just a, a gimme. Uh, so, Aaron, what was so easy about some of the stuff versus what's the roadblock on the other stuff? And I think you already touched on the roadblock. Okay, well, so... Um... With Persona Non Grata, um, when I originally wrote the book, I started off in a spaceport. Um, or, or the first day, spaceport. Guys, waiting for a plane is really what it boils down to. Um, he's waiting for his flight home. Um, From? As I get deep, uh, he's out in the outer reaches of space. So this isn't the end uh, of So he's retiring career. and he's coming back. Go on. Say again? No, go on. You're, you're uh, doing it. Uh, he's retiring from the military. He's got a plane ride home, and he's landing in Luna, which is a layover stop for him. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew that the story prevents him from going to Earth, at least as his plan. Um, so getting to there was great. Um, even getting him to onto Earth wasn't bad because you just you introduce new characters to do that kind of thing to help you along. Um, towards the end how do I finish this how do I wrap it up in a little bow but still leave enough unfinished over there to where I can draw from it again um, and this is probably about three chapters back from the end at the, uh, call it midway through uh, act three um, like okay I've got the twist I've got the turns I've got this going on but I've got to finish it and not just keep extending it keep, keep moving the goal line forward um, that was not horrible because I had a pretty good solid map there and then I had to adjust the tempo and the way I did that is I cut the first 20% of the book um, okay. and I just I, I moved it it wasn't necessary it, it didn't give you anything so I cut it and it put, I put it in my seed pile um, with Politicus I've got the advantage of I start off at the end of Persona Non Grata. It's shortly thereafter, but I've already got established characters. I do a quick rehash um, and a quick call to action inside of it uh, to basically where he's, instead of him being able to retire peacefully, he's been recalled. Um, you thought you were going to retire, but no, you're not, which creates this looming threat. Um, but that's your Act 1 section. When you get into Act 2, the flip i've already done the flip but getting it to where i can get back to act three to flip it again there's the roadblock mm -hmm. so what about you, you Travis? um what's your let's see ease and why is it easy and what's your roadblocks and what's your method of getting past those i remember uh when i was writing world of the orb uh, World of the Orb didn't used to have a prologue. It just started in Chapter 1, and it started with Marvin on the bus. Um, but I remember I was I was, I was, was in bed, and I had, and there was this line that came to me, uh, which was, uh, all the world is elements, elements and their righteousness and depravity. And I, and I was like, oh, and so I, so I, I, roll, I rolled over, and I, ugh, and I, and I scrawled it um, on, the, on what I keep next to my, my bed when that happens, so that in the morning I can interpret my hieroglyphics um, and <laughs> figure out what I wrote. Um, Wait till and, you need and I have that line. It is much more challenging. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, and I, I had written that down and I, and I'd left it and I was like, well, that's pretty cool. I wonder who's saying that. And I wonder what the, what the scene is. And, but it's somewhere in, it's somewhere in world of the orb. And, I knew that it was uh, Oren, who's this little like froggy guy looking guy. This uh, Ka Master is what he's called, and and I had that saved. And then there's this one day where I was supposed to be doing my homework, and I was just zoning out on the couch. And I was like, I, I remember it well because I was like all all splayed out and like stressed and tired and 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 just laying there. And and then the line came back to me: "All the world is elements, elements in their in their righteousness and depravity." And then I think, yeah, that's a cool line. And then all of a sudden, the rest of it starts coming through. 
you know, water with its life and its bitter cold, weather with its breaths and its fury, land with its foundation and stakes. And I'm like, oh, and then and I, so I stood up and I, I ran uh, back to the computer and, and I wrote it all down. And it was it was the one of the clearest um, and most magical sections that had ever come through. And I was like, this is beautiful. It was it's it's probably my favorite thing I've ever written like, just because of how it how it came to me. If I may. And real quick. Yeah. I, I am just dazzled by how you remember lines from your own work, because once I write, I remember so little of what I put down because I've moved on to the next thing. And uh, I suspect 20 years from now. Uh, I'm, you're just going to be at a place that I'm just going to be dazzled by. You already are, but, you know, it's so much talent right here in front of me. Go on. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 well, just the way, the way it, it struck me, it, 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 it stayed with me for so long because it had this, like, this, this, this thespian delivery and, and, and it was so symmetrical in, uh, the way it, uh, uh, the Cod Master listed all the elements and and how they have the um, the the potential for for use and misuse, and then how he relates that to people, and uh, how people can you know choose their own power and you know whether they're you know beguiled by the light or or deceived by the shadows. You know the path you take is up to you, and um, and destiny and uh, oh, so so that was that was one of the one of the my favorite <laughs> moments in writing it and, and one of one of the lines that came to me the easiest um and winslow winslow was pretty fast in terms of i had written uh the first chapter and one of the last chapters as short stories in high school and it was this it was this very distant uh like maybe like a, a, a week removed timeline in terms of like the chronology of what had happened um to those characters uh uh, just, I mean, a week isn't isn't too much, but in a Winslow book where everything's like happening right at one after the other, but I didn't know that. I didn't know it was originally going to be a book. And um, in way way later in college, I wrote uh, the second chapter, <laughs> what would become the second chapter, the trouble with mermaids, and uh, and that was that was that was pretty quick. And then when I looked at when I looked at how they lined up, I'm like, oh, this could be a collection of short stories. And then the next few chapters flowed just connecting uh, one and like seven and eight, which would which would be like this two part finale, and I and I realized how it lined up, and then I rewrote rewrote the ending based on what I had seen. Yeah, very good. If I can pass this to John, if you can answer the question real quick, because we're coming up on that second hour. Well, I'm sure tech manuals don't count for uh, the easiest thing to write. They do, actually, but I think. Be, is, I'm surprised Aaron didn't speak to that a little bit. But, yeah, tech manuals definitely count. The te technical manuals, you know, in the nuclear power Navy, those were, you know, pretty straightforward. You figured out, you know, what, what you needed the function to do, and you just wrote it down. I mean, I, I love working with creators to help them, you know, see their creations and stuff move forward. So that's easy. Uh, apart from me, uh, the uh, the other thing right now is we'll be leading into probably the next part of this discussion is that, you know, with with Tether, you know, I keep on getting distracted by science. So it's, mm. you know, so I tell you what, let's let's go straight into the second hour here. Let's do some intros. And, John, we're going to hand it right back to you and you could speak on that and blend the two topics right into the same thing. Um, I just want to let everybody know who has joined us since we started. I'm Travis Sivart. I'm the host of Right Night and an author of a couple dozen books. Um, one book is Triddington Birthright, and that is a steampunk Cthulhu twins who are moving through this plot line as this alien species is trying to violently take over the world after being shut down for thousands of years by humans. And they're now making aggressive moves to take over by bringing in Cthulhu-level monsters. Um, oh, and that is pick. a short story cycle where it's multiple short stories just interconnected chronologically. Um, and that was fun. I love the interplay between the two main characters. Uh, what about you, Tempe? I'm Tempe Wade. I'm the author of the Timely Revolution book series, uh, Revolutionary War Time Travel Adventure series. Books through one and four are out. Book five will be out next week. Uh, six, seven, eight, and nine will be along shortly. <laughs> Soon, hopefully, <laughs> as things progress. 
Uh, but yeah, that's me. Okay. Uh, let's go to John. Do an intro, then we'll pass it to Mike and Aaron. Well, I'm John from uh, Conquest Publishing and Jersey's Cards and Comics. Uh, here's some artwork for our upcoming Mirror Universe. Yeah. Oz title, Wizard of Oz. These are the kind of the bad guys in the book. I like that bear. <laughs> I like him too. Wait till you see Theodore, though. He's a big giant lion man. Oh. Um, if you'd like to join what we're doing, uh, you can go to conquestuniverse.com. It has uh, links to YouTube, Instagram, email. Uh, we're, we're looking to help uh, people get their visions uh, put into print. So, Michael? Hey, everyone. My name's Michael Thompson. I'm an independent author and illustrator, writer of uh, superhero books, uh, portal fantasy adventures like World of the Orb. This is a portal fantasy about two best pals on a field trip to the Museum of Natural History who sneak away from the group and break the one rule. She's not to go in the artifact room and definitely not to touch the orb. When they do, they're snapped into an alternate world of monsters, myths, and magic that sets them on an epic treasure hunt to find Earth again. What's the little gold stamp on the front? Uh, it's a Feather Cool Book Award. Very cool. Very cool. Aaron? Seven, I think. Uh, hi, my name is Aaron Kennedy. Uh, I'm author of the Persona Non Grata series, been a technical writer for uh, coming on 25 years now. I wrote the, uh, or I'm currently working on the Icarus Black Chronicles. Um, and that's basically me. <laughs> Very good. John, let's jump back to you. The topic in the second hour that we're moving to is Entangled Research, which comes straight from John, which is why I want to start with him. And this is in my understanding and concept is sometimes we start to research, whether it's science, history, or anything else, and we get down a rabbit hole to where we write a dissertation, we write a research paper that we want to put in our book that isn't right for the book. We can't hand this, this fascinating techno babble that we adored in our research. And John in particular, well, thank you, Tracy. Appreciate those bits. Thank you very much. And John... A couple weeks ago, when I was visiting him at Jersey Cards and Comics, mentioned, asked me, do you ever research something so much that you get lost in it and forget to write the book, or something along those <laughs> lines? And his well, was it's... quantum physics, right? Correct. So what were you saying, so, or how do you want to build on what we're going on? So, so basically, obviously, my, my background, I'm a retired nuclear engineer, uh, and I dabble still in, in physics and and those types of things. Uh, in the story that I'm writing, Tether, I have a set of twins that are quantumly entangled, biologically quantumly entangled. Um, and then they get separated, and one gets uh, shunted back in time, and the other one stays with their research team. Aaron? Well, and I started going into... Oh, go ahead. Um, for those not in the know, can you explain quantum entanglement, what it actually means. And also, I'm curious... Because it's, how... it's a buzzword phrase. Um, uh, and I'm also or... curious about how far in the time... What, what is your separation in time? Okay. So, uh, a quantumly entangled isotope or particle can share data, and distance and time is not relevant to its particular thing, and it's instantaneous. Wow. So, this is science. So they are quantumly linked together through data, if you want to consider it knowledge. Mm. Uh, in ours, um, they are, they'll find out later in the book that they are half-breeds or, you know, their parents were aliens, and, but we'll get into the particular thing. But what I was finding was, and, and as uh, Travis alluded to, was I got so deep into trying to make people believe that this was something that currently could happen or prove that it could happen um, or basically invent something so it would happen, um, I lost track of where the story needed to go. Do I need to prove that, you know, hey, look how clever I am that I figured out how to do this, and that's not what the reader needs. They need to engage in a book, and they need to put in how they fill in the blank so they get engaged with the story, not me telling them, oh, yeah. hey, there's this cool techno thing that I kind of figured out. I yeah. lost track that it's important that these two are quantumly entangled and not telling how it works versus that. I see Tempe waving well, a pen. I mean, Let's... on that note, oh, oh, 
No, I was just going to say, whoever's writing this, like, apocalypse stuff that's coming true, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> please stop. Okay, you know, I got locusts coming, and we've got the vi- this COVID. Oh, stop it. Just stop uh, it. Write happy stuff. That was John stop. the Baptist years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody write me winning the lottery, would you? I'm just saying. <laughs> Aaron, what were you well, going to say? My, my story, they find a whole planet, so it's a good, a happy ending, so... <laughs> Aaron, um, uh, Aaron, give your oh, thought, shoot, then we'll I pause it back to John. You lost it, John. Go on. Or if, if you don't have more, lemonade. so mm-hmm. oh, um, and and I tend to find that um, sometimes it's due to obviously your background kind of influences what you do. Um, so when I get into things where I'm writing about sports and stuff, it's the same thing. I played college football. I know these particular things. But believe you me, nobody really cares about your three-point stance. And they care about the grunting and the groaning part of the story and stuff and, and the sweating and the cheating. But they don't really care about the technical things that, you know, that, that you're, you're delving into to do those. Right. I, I, minor argument on that, because you got guys like Tom Clancy who are hardcore tech guys well was he's dead but um where they get into the technical aspects of these things um there's a great one about a guy writing a book uh and he's talking about the air force and the marine corps and the ospreys and he refers to the fuel that they use well he's when he did his uh, uh, initial publish he's talking about okay this one's got jp5 or whatever it happened to have been well the air force doesn't use that so he ends up looking like an idiot uh, but, but the Marine Corps does, and so on and so forth. And that technical aspect is part of the reason those guys, that niche audience, is there to read. Uh, you know, your hardcore, your hard sci-fi vice, your soft sci-fi guys like mine, uh, find some of that interesting. The, the 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 point overall is, and it's not yes, it's it's relevant that you have accurate information about the current technology, but the rabbit hole is when you're trying to create that technology oh. and to make that work. I, I I can definitely tell you about alloys and stuff like that and you know how you oh. make it now and, <laughs> and that that's current. But we're talking about, you know, something that doesn't exist yet. That I'm trying to make it exist. Oh no, no I, don't get me wrong. I agree with your underlying point. Uh, it's just the case of um, we've got nit uh, you've got a more general audience that doesn't care and you've got a niche audience that cares a lot um and it's the the classic uh um panel interview where they go on episode 13 of season three you talk about this how is that possible yeah but we're <laughs> gonna have the canon police to take care of that eventually <laughs> no but that's a that's the tightrope that you have to do and that's part of for me time management you know sometimes you just have to let go and say all right i've got enough of this it's it, it, it works. You ask a couple people, do you think that this is plausible? And you just move on. Oh, Me, sometimes it's not in my nature to let go of things sometimes. And it's like, eh, no, I'm going to figure this out. And so. Order. If I can, I ask the, the viewers some of their experiences in this. And I think Danny wrote something interesting that in. I did some uh, method writing, researched what it was like to be tied up and shoved in a trunk. I don't think I needed that much knowledge. Then she puts in parentheses, my friends had fun. So I don't know if they locked her in a trunk or she locked them in a trunk or, or by, you know, back and forth. But she said she got some great visceral <laughs> info to work with. It's, uh, it's wow. better to give and receive. <laughs> it's, uh, so is there anybody here who hasn't, just a raise a hand, if you haven't ever had this issue where you get lost in your research and so caught up in your research? So we've all had this experience, I'm feeling. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or we're a dirty liar. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I found that what I do is, to balance it out, like, battle scenes bore me. My eyes just close my eyes just gloss over when it comes to battle scenes and with the Revolutionary War, there's so many of them. I like to pick out the obscure facts that aren't really known as much and, and, and play on those. Um, and that's that to me builds a little bit more interest because people will, will stop and look it up and go, Oh, that really happened. Um, I think the most fun I had was researching 
like 18th century condoms which was a whole rabbit hole that I went completely down but it, it was fun and, and when when I when I wrote it into the book series which will be in book six when it comes out um you know I'm, I had a lot of fun with it because we've got a a, a woman from the tw- from 2018 re, you know looking at these condoms from the 18th century going that can't be comfortable that's not ribbed for her pleasure <laughs> that kind of thing so you know it's the little facts you have to plug on those because you know if if you you're doing a complete history lesson people will like me with the battle scenes will just completely gloss over and it's like uh i've lost lost interest i think that's a great gauge when you start glossing over you kind of take note and whether that's research or whether that's just a scene you're writing when you get to a point where you're like i'm bored your readers probably will be also now there's other times you're passionate about it uh I'm going to take the stage here, and I had one person contact me for a short story, basically about myths and death and how they tie into ancient cultures, and I did something about the River Styx, and I was so fascinated that I wanted to give the reader the information of the actual history of it, and I basically condense the history and threaded characters through it instead of writing a story and threading the history through it. And when the person came back going, I think you missed the point, Travis. Nobody cares. And it hurt my feelings, but they're right. <laughs> it's uh, And I went, oh, okay, well, you weren't clear. I'll rewrite it. And uh, to, to wrap that story up, uh, it was too late. They, they needed to publish sooner, so they went, no, we're good. Thank you anyway, and I missed my the train on that one. Victoria says, I love Victorian history. It's so easy to go down that path. So who else wants to talk about their research rabbit hole? I know Michael has something. Any, we'll go to you, Michael, and pop back to someone else. Uh, there, there's all sorts of interesting uh, moments that I can remember. Um, I for, for World of the Orb, uh, I was writing, there's a, a, one of my characters, Veronica, has a very cool crossbow. Uh-huh. Uh, weapon and it, it's it's a fantasy crossbow so it's self-loading and and has all these cool functions um but uh at a certain point when i was writing it i i thought to myself i've never shot a crossbow i'd like to go mm. see what it's like um so i can have that so i can just know because for reference. experience is a, yeah yeah for reference because experience is a lot like a color palette that you can dab on and and uh when you need it and um and just make your story that much more vivid. Um, and so I went to uh, I went to this little archery place on the side of the road, and I went in, and there was a there was a young man there. Yeah, and there was a young man there, uh, like a v- very young guy, um, who was running the shop. And I said hi. Uh, I I don't know if you guys let anyone test out your equipment, but I'm an author, and I'm writing a book where a character has a crossbow, and I've never shot a crossbow before. Is there any way I can try that out? And he said, oh, yeah, sure. He goes out into the middle of the store. He tugs on, like, a rope, and a mattress folds out from the ceiling <laughs> with this, like, a specialty-made mattress with this uh, board on the back. And so, and then uh, and then he teaches me how to string it. So you put your foot on uh, on the on the bow, and then you pull it back, and you hook it onto the rail, and then you have uh, the bolt. And, and I was like, okay, here we go. And the thing that I remembered the most was the smell of, like, the superheated metal of of uh of of this of this thing launching and shunk and this very incredibly satisfying just thunking sound as it, as it went into uh went into the target i was like oh wow you know so that was that was a really i, I was waiting for him to say hey this is a vegetable stand what do you want to do? <laughs> i'm amazed by the whole uh archery thing on the roadside what <laughs> Well, Mike, I, I think we need to make a road trip. This yeah. sounds like a plan here. <laughs> yeah, all it was cool. It was. I was. I was so. I was thrilled that there was this thing hidden in the ceiling. That was like. I was just thrilled by the mechanics of that. Um, but yeah, and so I think having having those experiences are good. Like especially if you, if you've never done something before, and then and then you have that uh, thing that you can reference, so you can uh, bring that scene or that item to life. Um, but uh, I, I think also if if you're in the groove of thing, one one way to not like get too spiral down the rabbit hole, because uh, for Winslow, I I love cryptozoology, so I'm I'm constantly I'm researching that, 
and and that's my reference. But if something's flowing, then I, you know, you, you just want to let it flow and then go in later with uh, some of this research to to either confirm your suspicions or or or, or whatever random thing came through, um, or find the like historical foothold that uh, you can you know you 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 can step on. If I may yeah. interrupt real quick with a couple comments, uh, Steampunk Countess Victoria says, I find some of the best tidbits for my steampunk novels. I have to make sure I do a twist uh, a twist to sci-fi so that's not historical fiction. And Danny asks an interesting question that we could touch on here. By the way, she says that's a really cool experience, Michael. Um, she says, do you all <laughs> ever end up world building, world building rabbit holes or is that overdeveloping not a thing? Um, for me, I definitely have done that, um, especially in my fantasy world where I have decades of role playing in that world where I have these interesting points. Um, and in my latest novels, I'm actually going to these points that I haven't been able to explore very much in a role playing game and bringing them into the novels, which is allowing me to open up those rabbit holes for the characters. But at that point in time, it's a nice setting, it's a scene, it's a environment tied into the story so yeah i think over developing you put it you put it in the back folder and then you pull from it as michael was just saying and interweave it through your story but as an author you could definitely enjoy going down that rabbit hole and john with his quantum physics and entanglement research throughout the whole book each scene he could tie one more tidbit in one more fact in so people who do want to research it or Aaron with his sci-fi which is soft sci-fi he's probably done the hard sci-fi research and he can pull bits from the hard so your hardcore people get enough that they can go oh this guy knows what he's talking about and I think that's a very fine line with an author uh, whether it's Tempe with her historic vague facts and tying him in it gives your hardcore people something to go, they know enough what they're talking about, I can forgive the fantasy or the sci-fi elements they've layered with this because they have some truth. And I definitely do that with talent agency and nanotechnology and genetic alteration and that sort of stuff. Aaron, I saw you raise your hand. Well, and you want to be considered part of the community even if you're taking artistic licenses within the content um a great example friggin and this probably falls on john's side we figured out how to friggin make artificial diamonds to store nuclear waste and they put out milliamps friggin fractions of nothing but you can run them in parallel to where they put out amps it takes a lot of energy to do that but this is where we start getting into converting waste uh both carbon and friggin nuclear into power um, and reducing pollution and stuff like that. And when we get into the utopian kind of world building uh, ideas of, oh, how do you have a planet that doesn't have coal and stuff like that? Well, this is how. Um, or uh, something for the hard sci-fi guys that I did was the way I describe um, hyperspace. And I use a very simple explanation of we're going to punch a hole through the universe. Um, mm -hmm. all you're doing is ripping the hole in the universe. Uh, the ship has a certain amount of mass and that says how long it can go, which opens whatever paths. Right. So small ships can take some paths, but not the same ones as a bigger ship and so on and so forth, which changes the scope of the map that they're looking at. Yeah. I'd like, I'd like to say that I just think what Danny said is so interesting, um, because world building is... It is a form of research, isn't it? It's like a research into the mind of the creator. And so when you see these images uh, that will go into your book and you see and and or or you want to find out why a character is the way they are, and you you dive deeper than than the reader uh, will, will ever go, and you you smuggle back that information that that you then layer and 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 dab on your on your creation to. To, to to give it this life and this history um yeah it, it is it is a fine line but uh it, it's interesting it, it's it's you uh for for like a high fantasy piece that has it for for a world that has its own history uh you'll reference world building much like 
uh, an author in a, a, a grounded, like real world based um, genre would reference those real world facts in their research. So I think that's, that's especially appropriate that that was brought up and, and, and really interesting. Yeah, the, and I mean, extrapolated technology and history, I mean, that's all part of world moving to start with. Yeah. And if it's part of your story, then you're kind of leading that the person on with that anyway, because they know that, well, this history is changing for this particular event or this reason. So, uh, yeah. World building is, I mean, we all do it, I think. I think a great way to bring your rabbit holes into your story is have a passionate character on the topic. Because, John, like with your quantum entanglement, if you have somebody in the story that loves over-explaining this stuff, you can go into that and start to drop things through dialogue, which is a better way to drop it, in my opinion, anyway. And then have the other characters shut them down when it gets too much. And that's you or your yep. readers going, stop. Um, Danny says, when I started it taking my writing seriously, I used to joke research. Nah, I don't research. I world build. But uh, as it turns out, it's twice as much research. Right. And, and that's a great point you had, Travis, is because we do have a, I do have a character like that actually has a photographic memory, a eidetic memory, and, and eventually the guys just tell him to shut up. <laughs> and I think that's a great way to bring it in. Back in time, he was a scientist and stuff, and it's like, it's not helping anything that we have to deal with right now. It's such a good way to make your you book know. realistic or, or your story realistic yeah. because that happens in real life. And create conflict and, um, without throwing a punch. Where yeah. somebody's like, we just don't care. Can you stop? Now, yeah. and, in and, comic books, we cheat, though, because we have these little tags that we put in there and says, go see episode or go see issue this or right. go reference this book. Well, you know, 3PO it's like, is okay. that character in Star Wars where he's going to mention facts or history or technicals and you get this little bit of info and then Han Solo or whoever says, nobody cares, stop talking. But it lets you deliver mm -hmm. that info in, in a way that is now comedic or friction yeah. um, and it endears you to that character because now you've seen this person who maybe you don't care about. But they have this knowledge, and they want to help, and they want to share, and they want to enlighten people. And you're like, eh, stop talking. And now you're the cool story is where you make that person relevant. Say again. Or, mm -hmm. And the cool part is that you make that character eventually relevant with the knowledge and stuff that he has, or mm -hmm. his quirkiness. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, you, you want to. Yeah, you want to create like moments of organic discovery. Um, so, so like we as the creator, we may know all these things, but um, it doesn't. It you can't you can't service the story adequately if you if you pause and explain everything. You want your characters, and that that's really satisfying uh, for readers. If if the reader feels like they're discovering it at the same rate as the characters, they're parting for yeah. right? I mean, yeah, engaged right. Engaged with you, what you're doing. It also gives is, you is a key. very easy way to create a unique character voice. And you're always going to know which character is talking when they start spouting techno babble, whether it's about history or magic or uh, quantum physics. And I yeah. definitely use and that. And that brings us back to actualization as well. Right. Because yeah. that's having having those specific things, the, those anchors for, for each of your characters makes them more uh, more specific, more, more realistic. And I definitely and, use uh, that cement with this book with the twins because one of them loves that technical science side and the other one is more let's keep moving and they have their own technical passions where they're not interested in each other's and so yeah that's Trudy and Spencer and, uh, hmm. Very also, cool. one thing I really enjoyed about that book also is in book one Trudy is dressed in proper Victorian garb of a dress and all the frills, and she hates it. And as we yeah. move on, each story, she's dressed more mannish and less Victorian proper. Till the very end, she is her own person now. And she's opened up her personality and dresses how she wants to. Um, that's unrelated to rabbit holes, but it's something I enjoyed putting in there, that transformation into who you really want to be instead of who people expect you to be. 
Yeah. Well, I, I caught flack in, in book one because my character, I when she got to the 18th oh, the century, pocket. put pockets in her dresses. <laughs> and I caught flack in a review over that. And I'm like, look, if I get thrown back to the 18th century, the first thing I'm doing is putting pockets in my dresses. Number two, the second thing she did was had a pair of leather pants made because she couldn't ride in those darn dresses. There you <laughs> go. Aaron? What? Well, uh, on that note, uh, my wife recently got a very nice dress. She doesn't wear them very often. She tries it on. She's like, oh, this is super cute. And then she puts her, she goes to smooth her freaking dress down, and there's pockets there. And she was more excited about that <laughs> than getting the dress the first time um, because they were there. It's just something that's not typically there. Right. Well, um, and, and yeah, when I, when I looked at the review, I'm like, what's the first thing a woman from 2018 would do? It was put pockets in her dresses. See, that is a positive <laughs> negative review in that this person yeah. was upset, but somebody else is going to read that review and go, I so get it. I, I would have done the yeah, same exactly. thing. So this is something where somebody else is like, this is wrong. And other people are like, it's so wrong, it's right. Shut up. And they'll buy the book <laughs> because they now know you did this. And they would have, too. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Because that, that was when I wrote it, I was very much, like, in my head, what would I do if it was me? You know, what's the first thing I would do? <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. And I'm like, that's all you can find to complain about, really. <laughs> that's a good sign. That, that yeah. Is good... Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. So, does anybody else want to talk on the question Danny asked about, do you ever all... In do you all ever end up in world building rabbit holes or is it over developing not a thing does somebody want to talk about that um i i well i talked i talked about it a little bit but but i think that uh i think that there there is such a thing as over developing if it's if it's really keeping you away from creating the piece you know if if you if you know what you need to know uh for for uh, the purposes of where you're writing, you you want to you should let yourself go because you may actually discover more about your world in the process of telling a story within your world. Mm. Yeah, John. Well, um, the the key thing, and a couple of us are we, we play role playing games and stuff like that, is so your 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 world developing and stuff like that, and you've named every single little podunk town that might not ever be seen ever in your book or in your story but you wrote it down and you know how many horses are there and you know how many cattle are in that place and you know that the inn's name is this and nobody ever went there <laughs> this opens yeah. up a great that, that's that is that is the go ahead john finish that, your thought. That's a... so that that is a rabbit hole for world builders or for people that you know, design role-playing games and stuff. Tempe, and then I'll give my thought, and then Aaron and give my thought. Go ahead. I, I, I think it's important for the writer to submerge themselves in the world, but not necessarily the reader. Because as a writer, you need to know all that stuff. But the writer does not. It, and it goes back to what Michael said about the tarp with the pen. You know, you, all the information's got to be there, but you've just got to decide what's important enough to show it. Yeah. And that was one of the first things when, when I started writing, Tara made it a point when she was editing my stuff. She was like, if it doesn't relate to the story at that moment, don't put it in. Um, and and that was that's something I have I've learned about. So if something and she learned with me as well that if I put something in a story, there's a reason for it. You might not know it until book two or three down the road, but there's an absolute reason that one little detail is in there for that reason. I don't put anything in there as filler. I don't put filler in books. Yeah, so. for me, I have a huge thing of footnotes and stuff off to the side. <laughs> nice <laughs> things, Aaron. Uh, well, uh, so one of the things that I re learned, and this was back in the Marine Corps days, was reverse planning. I'm, how do I get to the stage that I'm at now? Um, so, and it's kind of that entanglement thing. Um, talking back about Icarus Black and that, I start the character off in the middle of an asteroid field because I wanted to start him off someplace. That was a garbage scout. I wanted to start him off in a, hard with phrase, a shithole um, <laughs> that he couldn't escape, uh, kind of like Luke, uh, Luke on Tantuin. Um, the the urge to escape is a major motivation for him. And I'm like, right. okay, where am I getting here? And what have I got over in my existing universe that I can use there? And I came up with, well, right now, 
politics are pretty stable. So I backed it up one, and then I backed it up again about 70 years in the timeline. I go, oh, he's in this kind of horrible situation. It's like if we were doing modern times, we dropped somebody in the middle of the economic depression of 2005, 2006, um, was my concept. Uh, so I'm like, okay, what, what would be going on here? Build, build that friggin' that political empire up just enough to kind of set the tone, set the theme, um, which in turn, I'm like, oh, if I'm going to do that, I've got to take one of the, I've got to take the ship that he's there because there's going to be AI ship as well, but he can't be as developed mentally as Hart is in Persona Non Grata. It's a younger version of the same class of ship. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, okay, where am I at here? How is he responding? Is the ship more impulsive? Is the ship more inquisitive? What's going on here? What What's going to happen on a maturity level when you're talking about that? Um, and then stupid things. Go ahead, Travis. Did you want to finish your thought? Uh, one quick one. Uh, asteroid fields. And I freaking delved into, I'm in the middle of an asteroid field. Okay, how big are asteroid fields? How spaced are they? Are they as close as we think? Do you run into stuff? All that, uh, which is its own little rabbit hole of who cares other than just knowing it. Right. Right. Uh, Victoria made a comment which relates to a note I had just written down, and then I have another going back to what Tempe was saying. But Victoria says, I love that. If it doesn't relate, don't put it in. But know that if it's there, it's foreshadowing of what's to come. It's an Easter egg. And I had just written down Easter egg here. Easter eggs leading to future points. We see this all the time. I'll point it out with my son when we're watching a show or a movie. The guy picks up a Fabergé egg and stares at it and comments on where he got it from and puts it down. Is that useless? Well, later, somebody's going to steal that Fabergé egg or it's going to get knocked over. A risky business had this with a Fabergé egg where in the beginning, the mother is like, and don't hurt my Fabergé egg. And it is a major plot point at the end where it gets broken. Um, so when you're looking at the tight edited of a TV show or a movie, almost everything that is brought in relates. And if it doesn't, it's character right. development, so it relates to why the character reacts. When a person thinks about the dog they had as a child and how much they love that dog and they saved it from this, well, that's giving you a look into the person's personality of how they look out for lesser creatures or they want to rescue people they want to help this is a personality development so yeah those tidbits that we put in and then i'll pass it to you in a moment aaron can very much lead to future things the other thing i was saying too much research as john and tempe were pointing out um john you with your you've planned every town etc whether you're doing a role-playing game or a book that much planning of your world building can limit your story because you've now built a box or a maze that you have to stay in and it's no longer an open sandbox where your characters can do anything except follow these rails because there are these pre-made constructs that you're mentally stuck in. So maybe right. if you're planning the whole world, small village, the blacksmith is a thief, is enough. Um, you know, larger town, there's a criminal syndicate. That's enough. You don't need to plan the whole criminal syndicate because once your character gets there, if they ever do, you can then open it up with the crime lord is a woman and has seven brothers under her command. And that's not something you would have thought of in the initial thing, but it works better with your story. Aaron? Uh, well, the, the Easter eggs, go, going to back to that, mm -hmm. uh, in Persona Non Grata, in the first couple chapters, I make sure to... Uh, I point out that Aria is carrying a gun. Um, it, For reference, it's a Glock 10 millimeter. I never name it in there. I just point out that it's got friggin' uh, a centimeter friggin' size slug, uh, and it's mostly polymer, which he friggin' wears in a shoulder holster under his gear. Uh, it doesn't become important until later on in the story, midway through Act 2. Um, one of my beta readers goes, well, when did he get this? I'm like, okay, I need to draw more attention to it as an Easter egg, so people don't forget that he's got it, right? Because mm -hmm. um, it's important. Because it's important. It's a capability that he's got, and not just something out of nowhere. Uh, that uh, Deuces Machina uh, kind of concept. Right. Um, uh, John. Uh, but uh, to your point, 
No, well, it, I mean, in com in comic books, it's a genre all in itself because it's an insider joke for the guys that are working in the industry, and then it's an insider joke for the people that, you know, that are fanboys and fangirls that, you know, are are definitely always dialed into what you. Oh my God, did you see that right back there? That's one of the gems to, you know, Thanos is whatever, you know. But that's but it, it is a thing that actually in the comic book industry. <laughs> I swear there should be a job just for doing that. <laughs> yeah. So. In uh, my latest book, Portals, that's actually with Tara for editing right now, <clears throat> when one of my beta readers went through it, at the very end, one character pulls out a knife and uses it for the climactic scene. And when my beta reader read it, she went, what's with the knife? Where'd that come from? No, it makes sense in a fantasy world. Perhaps everybody has a knife on them. And that was my thought when I pulled it in. But it's a fair point, and I looked at this knife going, let me backtrack through the whole book and drop it two or three times, this knife. Let's make it an Easter egg. So at the very end, it's more meaningful, and it makes sense, and it, it's actually symbolic at the very end. If I could read a few comments real quick. Uh, Victoria says, I love that. If it doesn't relate. Oh, I already read that. Sorry. Uh, Word, good to see you. Danny says, that's also a good point. I've had a couple of drafts where characters themselves took things different ways while I was writing. And because I didn't know anything about that area, I left a nice open space to play with. Really cool to hear how y'all work that type of research out. Thank you. Oh, Danny, thank you for saying that. That's priceless to us to hear somebody go, yeah, John. On, on a quick note in that, I've actually had my players fill in those region sometimes when they get there oh you know you know they they start well i you know i want to go do this and it's like well now i can do that because i mean you you have to sometimes you know ad lib sometimes when they're when they're in those areas and sometimes your players will fill in gaps perfectly for you right oh abs absolutely on that i mean uh last week star wars watch watch this watch the stream um the, the characters are doing all the or the players are doing all the work you set up a situation and you let your characters or your players handle it they're they're going to react to situations based on these seeds that you've given them um, right and using the example of uh, started off John's character in a back to tank started off Travis's character in a freezer started off the two other characters in a droid repair bay go and they're trying to figure out okay well what is it and they go oh they come up it's a ship oh it's a hospital ship okay what do we got to do oh we got to get to the bridge uh, as they're asking these questions and they're figuring out where they got to go they kind of meet up with each other and hit adversary and all that shit and in writing your characters are your players and i think mm -hmm. tempe might feel this one um when you lay out this framework, this bare laid framework, your characters can fill those in beautifully because they have their own personalities and thoughts and impulses and motivations. And they will fill in that information that you didn't expect to put in the book. But here they are world building for you through their own personality. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm at I'm at the uh, I'm at a little advantage where like with the Revolutionary War stuff, my world's already built. I'm just researching what's already out there and then putting my own take on it with the the Celtic lore end of it. So, um, but with the fantasy stuff, with the fantasy stuff that I'm working on, um, yeah, I I'm learning more about my character as I go. And and with this with this piece that I'm working on, uh, he's telling the story in a lot of flashbacks. Um, you know, because he, he, in the opening scene, it's it's a really bad scene. A lot of people are dead, and he's remembering things, and that's how he's he, the it's information is getting scene, out though. there. He's, these little clips. It's a great what, scene, yeah. Tempe, and the way you know you yeah. you dropped it in there with it definitely makes the reader go, "Wow, what is this?" And, and you after that one scene, which is only a couple pages, you've got like three or four things in your hand as a reader going. I want to know more. So, yeah, that was I well actually done. cut it down. It's down to like two paragraphs, I think, is uh -huh. all it is now. Uh -huh. And uh, but yeah, it's and I, my character, I'm still learning a lot about him as I go too. And but the fl with the flashbacks, it's it's that's the way it's being told. So yeah, I think that's a great thing. I I I love how you worded that learning 
about about your characters mm-hmm. because you know sometimes sometimes you know we as uh, as a writer you may use the term like you know this person has certain rules you know they only use this uh these terms or, or they they only like react this this type of way um but like real people don't necessarily have rules real people have tendencies um but what might be interesting is like what what does it take to break that person that person's tendency what what gets that person to act out of character and and that's really that's really a beautiful uh thing that you said because that shows how you're thinking about your characters as real people and yeah, if i may and and go ahead, oh, go ahead. No, i'm sorry no no say no, your thing I, then I i'll read just, a comment I, no i was just gonna say that um with with this opening scene it's something that it, aff- it changes his life and it affects him to yeah. the point you know it, it it's a powerful scene and it, it changes his life in in like an hour it's he's, his a, whole world's different that is a great and, way to uh, open yeah yeah so we'll see we'll, we'll see where it goes word of wind says the novel i was working on last month i'm working on this whole subplot dealing with needing paper and getting ready to go full swing into paper manufacturing then i'm typing away and one of the characters says something in dialogue that solves the whole thing and that is not mm-hmm. as long as it's not the hold on let me fix all the problems with one sentence you know, if it creates a solution that your characters then can dig into and develop, that's great. If you're like, oh, we totally can cut this subplot off, well, then is, do you need that at all? Um, well, I love that. I love that. You know, you're letting your characters speak, and you're just kind of transcribing it, and that that's that's a that's a great thing um, to 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 have, just kind of like a like a, to be in like a reporting mode. And to know your characters well enough to sort of know and and let and let them be able to surprise you. What it's such a and, cool experience. And don't get me wrong, that can actually end up working cool to where the problem that one character is seeing is not the problem, but can be the root of other things that are um where they're the problem. And once you just go, uh, but what about this? And like, oh fuck. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> but true. but all the friggin' that subplot w- is not it's the thread of them doing all this stuff, which expands outward from them, but not, you're not it's, trying to solve that problem. The problem fact, doesn't yeah. matter. It's the fact that this person is, oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And they're just causing everybody else to living hell. Um, can be what's really the, you have a stated problem and you've got the actual problem is where I'm kind of go with this. Okay, so we're down to 15 minutes before we wrap this up. So let me go ahead and kind of represent the question and the topic in a new form and see if anybody has anything to say about it. When you've done all this research and you've gone down this rabbit hole, how do you apply it to engage your reader and open up the world instead of shut down your reader's concepts? As Michael says, where you're letting the readers get their own visualization and relate to it with too much information... We block them in, like John said, with overdeveloping the world. Not only do you stint your character's growth, development, and possibilities, but you also stint your characters in the same way, yeah. or your readers, whatever I didn't say before. Um, so, uh, any thoughts on that, Aaron? I got sure. some. And then uh, Michael, after that. We're doing all this research, and we go into these rabbit holes of various things. So uh, you start off going, oh, when did M&Ms come about? And then you end up looking at <laughs> World, uh, World War One bombers and stuff like that. And now I know about World War One bombers. Uh, but the idea is, as you're presenting all your information, you don't want your reader to try to go down those same rabbit holes. You want to kind of do the magic uh, and misdirect to where, oh, oh, what's going on here? And then all of a sudden, another segue into something else to where they go, oh, this is the important bit, and they forget about that for the time being. It's uh, you leave it with that Easter egg and for later on when you need it, but it's just a, it's a seed. Um, so we want to keep them. Fo- we want them on not necessarily. Ra- we want them on rails through the story, but never to know that they're actually on rails. Uh, kind of like being on a great uh, theme park ride, like Space Mountain. You can't see. The front, you can't see anything that's coming there, so you have no idea how big the actual roller coaster is. You just know that you started here and you ended here, and you saw all these things along the way. Mm. Um, <clears throat> a couple comments, if I may. Wordwin says, sometimes, and I may mispronounce the character's name, Ichi, 
thinks she has a grasp on something, Mackenzie turns that upside down, and Danny says, word, they make a great conflicted team, which I had said, it's great friction between characters. Um, and Wordwin says, it's like a cute version of Pinky and the Brain, except they're both goofballs. And, yeah, Nerf. I th think having those opposing views, it, it creates drama, it creates friction, it creates forward movement and character development all in one fell swoop, in one line. John, did you start to say something? Well, I mean, before I'm, well, it was probably pretty cheeky. First thing you want to do is uh, apply for a patent. So, you know, <laughs> all that research doesn't go to waste. That's true. But, um, I mean, it's back to bookkeeping. But if you're going to do all this research, at least set up a folder system and ways for you to go back and re-reference any of these things instead of just having them scattered amongst the, the Even multiverse. If it's bookmarks in your in your browser. Whatever. Just be able to get to it quickly so you can reaffirm. <laughs> Danny says, I heard that narf. Yes, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, no, uh, so we're in the age of Microsoft Word and Google Docs and everything like that. You've got revision mode and you've got save as. Um, I've got the original version of Persona Non Grata with all that content in there with bookmarks with footnotes with all that and i've got the line outs where i've cut it and it's been and referenced back to where it gets moved to and things like that what you got john well so um and i agree with that so in my particular genre in our field we have to have visual references for many 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 things for sure but yeah. it's just as important instead of having revisions and stuff through microsoft word is to have your research just like you would, um, so we're doing a World War II piece. Well, I need pictures of Spitfires and uh, BF-109s, but I also need, uh, you know, documents and stuff that were relevant to that particular time at the time. So the research I'm doing, I want it there. I don't want it some cliff note, you know, off to the side in that particular oh. project. Uh, but because for us, we do a wide variety of things. So it's sort of like a... Uh, it's a it's a writer's morgue or a picture morgue was what we used to call for our for for artwork. Um, it's the same basic structure though. Now yes, with um, with supercomputers and stuff like that. I mean, I have hard drives that are just particular things. Yeah. So oh, I see. Tempe, absolutely. And with Aaron, like, oh, if we could let Tempe have uh, a moment, I see her waving her pen. Yep. Oh no, I was just gonna say I'm opposite. I'm old school. I I handwrite my note. I have a binder where I hand wrote notes. I have. If there was something I needed the whole sheet, I would print it off and stick it in this binder and then make notes off to the side. Yeah, I mean, I've got a binder this thick of Revolutionary War stuff. And I'm a little bit different than Aaron because I'll pick out the little known facts and kind of harp on them because I want people to go research it and learn it for themselves. I want them to look at that fact and say, that really happened and then go pick up a, a history book and say oh that really happened and it happened right here and this and oh that matches up perfectly with what's in the book how much research did she put into that you know hey, Tempe, so that's that's when yeah. it comes to fantasy if you look behind me right here you're going to see a row of notebooks with labels on it like three inch uh -huh. wide binders and they all have page protectors with just decades of notes from my fantasy world. So sometimes when I write, not only do I pull up that map that I think most of you had seen at some point in time, but I have these where I can go, I'm going to that city, I have notes on that city or that character. Let me go find it in this. So yeah, it's uh, the handwritten note, modernized. I do a lot on this and then I transcribe it to Word documents or whatever on my computer later. But yeah, I'm definitely with you in... Handwritten. And, and I bought, I, I have textbooks, I have historical textbooks that I used. I found a um, CW Colonial Williamsburg guide from the 1960s that had more information than what their current ones did. And I used a lot of that. And I've got notes scribbled in the books and in the textbooks and all of this, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, but yeah, I'm very much old school. <laughs> I'm like handwriting. I got notes everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately for me, I got to go to and think about publication later on and stuff. Like we have software that converts into, you know, 25 different languages and stuff. And I can't throw my notebook <laughs> at it and say, hey, Russian. You know? If I can. Uh... But I understand. And yes, I'm the same way. I mean, I, I take Copa's notes and stuff like that. I still do my taxes by hand. Are you kidding me? 
but that that was the way. So even back when I was going through nuclear power school, I mean, notes were were required. I mean, I remember going in one time with the instructor. I know it's a little off topic, but because um, I was having a problem with you know one of the the lectures, and he goes, "Well, let me see your notes." So he started looking through my notes. He turned around into the paper shredder and dropped my notebook into it. He goes, "Here's the syllabus. Start writing." Oh I my. Said, <laughs> so off I went. But that's how I learned a little bit more. Is actually, I think sometimes by writing it down, you're going to get we got more. got some great comments over here. If I can so, read some yep. comments, please. Um, uh, Word of Wind says, I have crap loads of info in Scrivener. Victoria Steampunk Countess says, yes. Or, yep, I have folders, one in particular called Where to Put This, full of great lines, plot ideas, etc. Danny oh, says... <laughs> That is good advice. Good Lord, I can't find anything in my bajillion page world building docs because I might reference a topic differently, have papers tucked somewhere on my bookshelf or draft notebook, and often with so much and many color codes, working on applying consistent organization that can be searched digitally or otherwise. And Danny, what I'll tell you about that is there gets a point in time where you start to yell at yourself and you will take three days and spend it just organizing your notes and what you hope what you hope, no guarantee, will be referenceable. Or, I, I, I don't know if I just made up a word. Later. Because, yeah, these notebooks back here are not nearly as organized as the computer. But on the computer, trying to figure out which folder something in can be more challenging than ever opening up a book and flipping through it. Aaron? Uh, something I've done with my PhD dissertation is... Oh, I've got a friggin' PDF document that is one source, and then you've got the citations below it, and you got to kind of follow the citations down that rabbit hole to get wherever you want it to go. Um, when dealing with the military side of things, they don't cite anything, or they'll reference a policy, but there's no direct link. Uh, so what I've got, I've gotten into the habit of doing is doing PDF edits and adding the hyperlink to the citation on that one. And if I go, oh, it's a, uh, it's physical fitness related. And I go, oh, okay, here's that. And then I got to follow a rabbit hole via yeah. my own links <laughs> database of PDFs uh, or my master document. That's got all my links in a quick uh, literary bibliography. Um, when do you make that? Where it's got, oh, is that like after the again? project is done, you go back to all your research and create that document? Oh God, no, no, no. You have to do it as you're building. Oh yeah, uh, you do while you're hypertexting as you're doing yeah. stuff. Yeah, and every time you open up a link and you go, okay, there's something valuable here, friggin' you pop it into your working document, you add the quote that you were looking at, and then you add a synopsis of the entire thing or the abstract so that you can find uh -huh. it. Th this is what I wanted to talk about on this one, is, yeah, we can bookmark, we can copy links, we can write things down, but if you can't find it again, and keep in mind, websites disappear. So what Aaron mm -hmm. just said about the quote the synopsis invaluable and mm -hmm. also oh, and a file folder that's got the downloaded pdf version of it right right and something else i'll tell you is everybody's going to research in their own way there are commonalities even the most different people but in general you have to do it how you'll find it if you're tempe i am guessing it's going to be different from how aaron does it and there's not a wrong way to do it if you can find it if you can't find it there might be a better way. <laughs> so mm. just keep that in mind. And that will evolve with you um, once you get so frustrated with your own research system that you realize you cannot use it efficiently. And at that point in time, please do yourself the kindness of taking that three days or three hours or three weeks and creating the system that works for you better. It, it is... Do it between books. Do it in. I don't recommend doing it in the middle of a book, but you do what you got to do. Um, well, I'm on version 4.0 of my filing system, mm -hmm. so it's well. Considering my filing system started in my teens with D and D, and some of those notes with, I had pretty decent handwriting back when I was 15. I'm okay, <laughs> but uh -huh. you know, how easy is it to reference? I have to first and foremost remember I have a note somewhere, and then it's a matter of finding it. And one day. I hope to do exactly this and take all those books and digitize them, even if it's just scanning every document in and creating a folder with the same label as those notebooks. Which, by the way, for $50, $60, you can get a document scanner that just USB plugs in and just easily scan. Yes, Aaron? You've got a phone 
with a camera on it. You literally snap, right. flip the page, snap, flip the page, and now there are friggin' uh, OCR readers that can actually read that stuff. John? There are services that will do that for you. So. <laughs> does, it, does, does that true, too? That? That's a matter of budget sometimes, too. So depending where you yeah. were... You're going to buy that scanner. I mean, I think that's true. usually in that cost. So. That's true. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Whatever works best for you is the bottom line. Uh, a couple of comments. Wordwin says, what's even better is when you do find it, you can't figure out what it means. Okay, I've had that. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but like Michael with his 2 a.m. bedside note. I hire a yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Victoria says, yes, yes, yes. Transfer those notes and back them up somehow. Because whether it's, heaven forbid, your house catches fire and your handwritten notes disappear or your computer goes down, or Google collapses 10 years from now. And by the way, I'm going to interrupt myself. Poet, glad to see you. This is one of my regular viewers out of uh, uh, Sweden. Sweden? Sweden. Sweden. Um, good to see you, Poet, and I'm going to read your comment, but after I toast you for popping in in the middle of the wee hours for you there, Poet says, I have everything in a folder structure, that's like two more folders away from developing its own consciousness. Thank God for modern computers and the ability to search the entire folder structure from the command line. Yeah. Yeah, find what works for you. If that is absolutely a shelf full of notebooks, do that. If it's paying somebody to scan it or snapping pictures or hand typing it or bookmarking, just keep in mind nothing is constant except change. And mm -hmm. everything disappears eventually. This is a truth in history. You don't even have to research that shit. Um, so, well, VHS tech are demagnetizing now. They, you can't watch them anymore because they're going away mm. on their own. Oh, I should get these like three tapes that I have and digitize them eventually, <laughs> real soon. Um, closing notes here and closing thoughts. Let me read these comments, and I'll give everybody a chance to give any closing thoughts on either topic tonight. Um, Victoria says there's a scanner tool on iPhone. Danny says, LOL, the middle of the night, brilliant idea that translated into something like crazy clowns eat fish while dancing on a banana, but you thought it had to do with your character growth. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've all had that. We're like, what the hell was, Ugh. closing thoughts, guys, who wants to go first? Rabbit hole or visualization, actualization. Go, Michael. I think, um, something that that unifies the two is uh, one of the tangents we went on where it's 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 knowing enough to begin but 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 leaving yourself enough space to allow your characters to surprise you and i think that's a beautiful thing because um you want those organic moments of discovery that not only your readers will have but but you'll have as you're writing it so i think that was a cool thing that we organically discovered uh as a result of uh, the show and, and the comments so. and it creates a character win your character suddenly develops beautifully yeah. when you translate that into whatever your character expresses it as john yeah for sure i, I think overall and uh, as michael said um keep an open mind when it comes to these particular things you know seek out other people that are doing uh things in your genre um, sometimes you are going to find some uh, unique things from other perspectives. I'm lucky that we get to work with kids and stuff. So, you know, kids do say the craziest things sometimes, <laughs> but they're super creative and you can work with it. So um, the, the rabbit hole thing, I think sometimes that's just ourselves having to tell ourselves, stop it. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it just kind of boils down to that sometimes. To respond to John's thought, there is a, Hold on, I think I might have lost a thought, damn it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just jump to Tempe. What? If it comes back to me, I'll comment. Yeah, you know, the the one you help today might be the one that helps you tomorrow. So, you know, help pass it down along the line. And as far as the notes, you guys digitize yours. I'm saving mine because I'm going to sell them for a billion dollars when <laughs> I hit it big. <laughs> Not a bad thought. I was getting rid of the paper ones. I'm I sure. did remember my thought real quick. Um, read. Your best research as a writer is to read. This is to learn the rules, to break the rules, to understand how other people do it differently, possibly better, possibly worse, and both have value. So read. 
and and learn that rabbit i will read your comment in just a moment welcome to the stream glad you made it aaron any closing thoughts no i think that's a great closing thought okay. so i'm gonna keep my mouth shut rabbit i'm gonna read your comment here well the stream title mentions entanglement so my brain tried to squeeze my story through a bbo crystal to split the bugger into entangled pairs rabbit you missed john talking about entangled characters quantumly entangled characters that are separated by time and space but Great show, guys. Thank you so much for you for joining awesome. me and expressing all these things. Definitely, Rabin, do exclamation point me. Danny, word already did it. Anybody else who streams, feel free to do the exclamation point me. Support each other. Grow, learn, develop, and keep writing. Let's do some outro music and get the hell out of here, guys. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Danny says, read outside your genre. Helps you see what possibilities are out there. Absolutely. And the other writers, content creators, and all around amazing people for our discussion here on Right Now. Follow those writers, guys. Hey, Gary, thanks Join for popping again in. again soon, and until you do, make sure you create with passion, enjoy the journey, and remember, every night can be right now. Good night, everybody. Thank you.